This comes down to whether the company or the organization has some kind of existential threat. Right. If they're feeling threatened, so they, they see competitors that are going faster, they're worried, they, you know, maybe you start having a few bad quarters, we've got to go fix something. Um, you see this, governments have a bit of a different problem. The existential threats sort of occur, maybe like the Second World War was an existential threat in the UK, right? So there was a huge amount of innovation that happened in government there, because like, well, we could get bombed out of existence or we can figure this out, right? So, but most governments have got very sort of, you know, they, they're stable, you work in government, it's, you know, it's a relatively slow moving thing, but very constrained. So it's, it's difficult to do there, um, to figure out what is, what is the real driver for things. Maybe there's, you know, we'll shut you down, your department, take all your money away, is the existential threat. But so there's, there's, so I think that the, you need that feeling that there is, there is at the top level in a company, there's got to be a need that, that, to change. And uh, some of it comes from overall things are speeding up, as I think, uh, you know, at the, as competition speeds up, more and more people, players in a market will speed up, and people that don't speed up are the people that get left behind and go out of business. Hopefully. So, so Ellie Goldratt has a or had a, <coughs> a, a description of um, so one. There's a great interview with he's the guy who wrote the goal, uh, um, and invented theory of constraints. And he's um, there's this great interview with him, and they're saying so like all this stuff makes perfect sense. Why isn't everyone doing it? How long does it take people to get it? And he said, my experience between five and 15 years, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, why? And he says, well, you need three things to line up. He says, you need exactly what you're saying, existential threats. So he calls it downward pressure, right? You need some kind of immovable deadline. You need to have tried everything else <laughs> and be desperate. And the third thing you need is information. He said, I'm good for the third one. But so what I do is I'd wait around for the first two. You know, I stay friends, and then sometimes they go, oh, we're in crisis, and he goes, oh, glad you asked, right? right. And, and, so, and so you can accelerate that yourself by choosing to cause those two. And some of the stuff Nicole was talking about is like, um, you know, we, we set ourselves up to say, we will move this fast. Oh, crap, now we need to solve for that. Right, there's some information out there, we can go and start to do that, but that's a choice. Yeah, so you're saying meantime between, mean between hair on fire moments is Yeah, about is, is around years. about a generation, I reckon. <laughs> but, <laughs> Maybe so, Nicole. What's what's how, what are you seeing? I mean, the traction you've pr produced this this uh, DevOps report now, two or three years worth of data. You've got some trends in there. Are you seeing people adopting more of these ideas and getting traction from from the lean we DevOps are. movement? So you know, it it's interesting because it the DevOps movement really started with startups or with web ops shops, and. You know, there's this thing I've said for a few years, which is, you know, healthy respect through fear is still respect. And so you, <laughs> you saw companies saying, oh, that's really interesting what they're doing over there. That, right on. And then there's this thing where all of a sudden it's like, oh, shit, you know, survival is not necessary and we're going to crash and we're going to crash hard and we're going down, we're going down, we're going down. And all of a sudden it was everyone calling everyone else saying, okay, so I hear you're doing this DevOps thing, help me out, how do I do it? Because I have to do it now and I have to do it for real. And they're realizing, so I don't know if anyone here surfs, like I don't surf, but there's this thing where um, it's called the duck dive and like the wave is coming. And if you kind of hang out near the surface and the wave is coming, you're toast. So you have to do it all the way. Like you have to go under, like you have to go under and you have to do it all the way. And if you like hang out near the surface, you're just going to tumble. And so we have these companies, like a couple of them are kind of trying to hang out depending on the industry or depending where you are in your company. And if you're in this, um, if you have this downward pressure that Dan was talking about and you're in a tumultuous situation or you've got too much pressure, you're, you're going to fail. Like survival isn't mandatory. That's totally fine. You could fail. That's nice knowing you. Um, or if you decide to really commit and go through the whole thing, then we're seeing industries that have traditionally been not fast moving or traditionally brick and mortar, retail industries, finance industries, even some government industries. So, you know, the US government right now is going through this massive transformation shift where all of a sudden they're like, oh, we're toast. So they're starting to do even DevOps transformations there where, but they, they realize that if you try to do it the halfway, 
that they tried to do one or two years, it was just massive. They were just bleeding money in massive ways. So they're having to do like the full dive. But that's what it was. It was healthy respect through fear. It's still respect. <laughs> and then it was all of a sudden, you either go all the way or you don't. And there are still a few holdouts that are kind of like waiting and saying, that's sweet. And we're going to stand back and watch. But I think it's, it's kind of going to be this wave of you're either going to survive or you're not. And a lot of people are starting to see that it's kind of this impending. I wasn't going to say it, but yeah, impending doom. Impending <laughs> change for the better oh. or something. Impending honey badger. Carrying honey badger. I might want that slide. <laughs> um, I think for the rugged concept, it's, it's much lower adoption than you would see for DevOps. Um, Which where is seen scary. It, well, it's, it's, I think it's a newer idea, really. So it, it's, it it's more about idea. it's coming. <laughs> well, I think it's a logical inevitability that if you're going to survive, this, you're going to end up coming full on into DevOps. And then if you want to accelerate DevOps and get it at scale, especially in highly regulated environments, you're going to have to do some of this stuff. Um, so we just want to be ready for, with the patterns and with the, the lessons learned and the mistakes out of the way so as people do it. Rugged's been around for, I think, seven years. Um, we, it's really shocking and surprising when I encounter it in the wild because we don't have a very formal command and control anything. There's a manifesto. Um, but a large airline has been using it for six years. Um, some of the big banks are using it for procurement leverage over their suppliers. Um, with DevOps, I think if you look at one of the most mind-blowing existing proofs of the year last year was Gene's DevOps Enterprise Summit, right? Because this was Fortune 100, highly regulated, 100-year-old organizations doing it for real, not just talking about it. So I think that's where you saw it wasn't just unicorns, it was also horses. And I also think that demographic is the ones who were making us pull s smart, scalable security practices into play because they, they have Sarbanes-Oxley, they have PCI, they have all these things where it's the antithesis of rugged. And they're saying, how can we do compliance at speed? Um, and the reason I have hope is people like, I think the cool, one of the coolest presentations was Mark, um, what's Mark's last Schwartz? Name? Mark Schwartz Mark from Schwartz. the US Department of Homeland Security Immigration Services. I can't think of anything more horribly backwards and defunct than IT in the federal government in the US. And yet he's a, a, a living, breathing human chaos monkey shattering their notions of IT because he's just so successful on every project he's given, they keep giving him more and more and more projects. And because of the consequences of his mission, he's pulling in more and more and more rugged principles. So, so this starting point was a year-long mandated waterfall progress, pro process which was written almost, you know, basically a huge document. It says that all development must finish before any testing starts. It was like, it's that, that, of course. So I think it was, it was written a, 15 to make, years ago. A, to make one, like Seriously. a one line change of, uh, to a website was, you had to use this process and you, it, the, the smallest possible change had to go through this process. And he ended How up getting something test? to, you no, no, but this moving. was just what well. the process said and everyone saying we have to follow this process. So that was the mindset. So he broke it to be, you know, they're, they're doing things in days or weeks or whatever that would Previously, have taken them from years, and yeah, I said they really him, did fix it. But it, it is, it is, it is a, a, a really great presentation. If you haven't seen that talk, it's inspiring. It's also quite humorous because he comes on saying, "You won't expect to see me." Right? Right. <laughs> and he's got this waving this massive pile of paper at people. When I when I met him, I said, "You're both inspiring, and if you as soon as you get fired, I'll try to find you a job." But he hasn't been fired. <laughs> he's been yeah. rewarded. Yeah. But uh, I want to pick a pick on something you said. I think uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous, they say, you, you know, you have to hit rock bottom. So I think, I think I yeah. say that. <laughs> <laughs> I have a friend. <laughs> you know, another way to put it is you have to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. So yeah. I think um, yeah. a physics teacher said, no one changes until the pain of maintaining inertia exceeds the pain of making change. And I think the reason that Rugged has hope and DevOps and Rugged DevOps together have hope is the really serious high profile breach victims, they've kind of found out through necessity just how inadequate and what an abject failure security best practices are. And that's why I was really happy that Shannon's gonna speak because she's lived some of those abject failures and has made the necessary adaptations to survive and thrive. So I, I have hope that even though we're early on, um, it's kind of what you have to do to survive and people will be um, very delighted as they start playing. So uh, an example of that, uh, I was working at a, um, 
proprietary trading firm a few years ago um, who are pretty good at what they do and take security quite seriously and all that kind of stuff. And they decided they wanted to get an audit of their, their applications and infrastructure. They, they, they consider themselves very much kind of hard shell soft center kind of organization. So they got two, they, they asked for two different people to come in and take a look around. One um, was a literally a couple of guys in suits with a checklist and a process and whatever from a, a large well-known consulting firm and they came in and sat down and they spent some days walking around the place interviewing, looking at things, poking stuff and they came back, gave us a pretty, pretty clean bill of health. And this other guy came in, I'm not making any of this up, this other guy came in, um, sort of shaggy hair, t-shirt, jeans, came up to the uh, reception desk and he said, hi, I'm, and she said, oh yeah, the elevators are over there, because she thought he was the elevator engineer who'd come to fix the broken lift. <laughs> and he said, oh no, I'm, I'm actually come to meet your CTO and blah, so they sat down, and while he's sitting in reception, waiting for the CTO to come out of a meeting, he's hacked the Wi-Fi, got onto the servers, he's walking all over production, and he's got this list of stuff, and he goes, um, we should probably talk. <laughs> like, it's just like, we are not worthy. You know, people, there's, there are people who can do that stuff, and it is unutterably terrifying when you meet them. <laughs> so it's really good to have them inside the tent, is all I'm saying. Some of them are in this room. <laughs> some, of them are, some of them are sitting here watching you right yeah. now. Yeah. So we've got, we've got some questions. Uh, I'll take one of the easy ones first, which is, uh, how do we get the slides, <laughs> the presentation? Um, so we're recording everything. I mean, collecting the slides. I've got all, and we're going to be collecting all the presentation slides, and we'll put them all up over the coming days or whatever, how long it takes to do that. But, but uh, Everything will be available. Um, let's see. Question for, for Josh is, um, in profit-oriented orga organizations, this all looks fantastic, but how do you influence not public sector organizations? What are, how are you seeing the, the take up there and how, what, what's driving that? Um, trying to define the purpose of the question. Um, I think the patterns are useful, especially when you have no resources. I mean, I think I had this one guy said, "We're our IT department's too small. We can't do DevOps." And I said, "Well, an IT department of one is inherently DevOps in one person." So, um, <laughs> the way I look at it is, you know, that the phrase "necessity is the mother of invention." I think this was always the superior way to do it, regardless of your staff or your budget. And in small organizations, you know, I'm in two nonprofits as well as my day job. We have no IT budget, so we have to be lean, we have to be Spartan, we have to think smart. Um, I don't think the patterns are incredibly different. There's nothing, that's, there's nothing in the rugged philosophy that says go buy a bunch of stuff. I think it's more about smarter design choices, smarter implementations, smarter instrumentation. So I, if the question is how does somebody without a budget do this, I think the patterns are almost identical, but we could, okay. we could talk more. Or maybe if it's what's the motivation, in the private sector it could be profits, in the public sector it could be reputation. Mm -hmm. I mean, either way, yeah. you don't want a security breach. Well, we help, we help groups that help dissidents, and if they fail, people die um, or are imprisoned. So um, I or think elections. I mean, yeah. Mark Schwartz keeps getting reappointed. Right. Yeah. So another comment. Um, <laughs> you're talking about Ma you know, in no. Maven, there are some artifacts which have known security flaws. Yeah. So the question is, uh, can't you just block those? Should, is, shouldn't you be you know, actually shutting My things question. down. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so during the interview process, I asked, why don't we just get rid of all the vulnerable ones? Um, it's a very straightforward question. And the, the, the really simple answer is, um, you can get these projects directly from origin. Um, typically when people try to do it, they get counterfeit versions. So it's a public benefit to have all the versions of every project in one place in a validated form. Second, if I delete it, people will go get it from their cache proxy or from the project directly. Um, Third, people would stop using the service entirely. So there are tools that I provide and others provide that do sit in between Maven and do give you supply chain intelligence heads ups in all sorts of parts throughout the development life cycle, including IDEs. Um, but until people are starting to look at the available information that is being shown to them, um, if it's just a batch script grabbing something, um, we'd break builds if we start stop doing that. Okay, we've got some questions on the Agile talk, so what do you... So, uh, the future sounds promising, but has anyone done it yet so we can measure it? Huh. So, I'm looking around the room and seeing some people I've been working with over the last few years. Um, one guy in particular works in the um, securities operations part of a large bank. Um, 
just to give an idea of the scale of his operation. So securities is, is anything that gets traded that's interesting. So stocks, shares, futures, options, all that stuff that you hear about on uh, trading exchanges, they're all securities. Operations is all of the unsexy stuff that happens after the trading's finished. So matching everything up, netting, paying tax, doing all that stuff, making sure the numbers add up to zero. They never add up to zero, right? Because you have millions of stove, well, not millions, certainly tens of stovepipe systems all doing similar things. His world is quite interesting. He, uh, he's responsible for the flow trading of a trillion dollars of stuff a day. Right. I mean, figure out how many microseconds you need to be down before that starts costing. It's not very long. Yeah, so very, very low tolerance of stuff. He um, pronounced a couple of years ago when I was working with him, uh, he said, we're going to halve our lead time to deployment. Okay, we're going to halve our lead time for anything, and we're going to double throughput, and we're going to do that without reducing quality in any way. Right. And a whole bunch of people looked at him and went, you're bonkers. Right? Where this bank, we've got this much blah, and he said, right, and that's why we need to do this. Mm -hmm. And so he said, we're going to halve the lead time to, 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 for everything. He knew when he said that, that's not going to happen. Right? There are some places where you can destroy the lead time. You can go down to like a tenth of the lead time. There are some places where, because of the amount of external touch points and, and formal handoffs and blah, that you won't make much of a dent. What he was doing was shifting everyone's thinking 90 degrees. Right? Everyone's thinking about activity and busyness and features and story points and all that other nonsense. He's saying, that's all detail. We want to get there faster. And the way we get there faster is being better at getting there. And it caused a cultural shift, and it's still, the, it's still un unrolling. So there are companies at scale who are taking this, this shift in thinking. Um, and what's the, the, the thing that's both frustrating and exciting for me is there's no, uh, what's the word? There's, it's very hard to measure the trajectory because everything leading up to a shift into lean operations is about measuring activity and effort because that's the stuff you can see, mm -hmm. right? So I have my testing team and I can measure the amount of testing. I've got my uh, support guys and I can measure tickets because we love measuring tickets, right? Uh, mean time to whatever's interesting, yeah? All of those things. And I measure all these local activity metrics. I'm not looking at the arc. I'm not looking at the big picture. When you shift to like a lean mindset, you start caring much more about, essentially all I care about is lead time to thank you. What's the shortest time between now and someone saying thanks, that's what I wanted, right? Everything else is detail. And because we weren't measuring that before, it's kind of, you start, you're starting over. You can derive a lot of those numbers anyway from existing systems, but by definition it's going to be a bit of a guess. Um, but I would start, and the trailing indicator is amazing. The trailing indicator is you become more profitable, you get things to market faster, all of that good stuff, but it is a trailing indicator. And someone was saying, yes, I was talking to someone yesterday, and they were saying about they're basically moving the Titanic, but with a very tiny little rudder. And, <laughs> and that's kind of what it feels like for a bunch of time. When it starts moving, though, you know it's moving. So let's move to Nicole. So there's a question here about the evidence of causation. So I thought you could talk a bit about the methodology behind the surveys you've, you've been producing? Sure. Um, so quickly, Statistician and me will clarify. Um, we didn't do anything on causation. Um, we did do some prediction, though. So prediction and causation are, are two different things. So there was some prediction. There was also quite a bit of correlation. Uh, correlation, so difference between correlation and prediction. Correlation is just when two things move together. Um, prediction is when one thing can predict another. Causation is when one thing actually creates or make something else happen. So we didn't actually, we never did causation because that has a much higher statistical uh, threshold that we have to cross. So we did do prediction in some things. The things that we did prediction on is um, which, uh, which factors in the environment make IT performance move and which things in the environment make organizational performance move. And so, or not make it move, predict that it will move. Mm -hmm. um, so the things that help predict that movement in IT performance um, were discussed and those things were generally um, some tooling decisions, some cultural things, and some, some practice and process things. Um, and so there was another question that, you know, how, how do I define DevOps? That's kind of a, a, an amorphous term, but that's, those are, <coughs> some of the things that go into my definition for DevOps because those are the three key components that, that tend to go in there. Um, and so the methodology behind what we did is we used a cross-sectional survey, so it's one point in time. 
Um, in order to capture prediction, you have to have one of three conditions. Um, it has to be either longitudinal, this isn't longitudinal because it was one point in time, or it has to be, um, uh, I'm losing the other one, uh, theory-based, and this one was theory-based, so we did it based on models of business, uh, technology, and lean, lean management. So we did those and then we used uh, very carefully uh, crafted and worded uh, psychometric models. And then when possible, we also used um, some objective measures. So that's where we pulled in um, the objective measures of... Um, company success. And yeah, company, like that, company right. success and stock market tickers. And then we did all of the... We did extra t statistical tests to make sure we didn't have um, common method variance, common method bias. So for example, to make sure that people didn't go through the survey and like answer one on every possible thing or three on every possible thing. So, um, and also it's like, for example, sometimes just by taking a survey, you end up being biased because I only captured or I captured most of the data through a survey. So uh, we did early versus late responders. Um, all the measures were statistically um, valid, reliable, discriminant validity, convergent validity. Um, and then we used uh, different statistical tests to check for prediction. So some partially squares, some covariance based, um, mostly um, correlation based measures because those maximize for prediction versus data fit to the model. I'd be happy to talk stats if anyone wants. <laughs> so it's not, not very so rigorous that, then. Yeah. <laughs> So I mean. this is, this is I, I, yeah, most, most surveys are like Stone Age compared to the kind so, of analysis. Yeah, so this was actually, the, the thought that um, went into this. This and, was actually yeah. a research report and not just a marketing report. And we're hearing word that um, several analyst firms are pointing other companies to this report, yeah. which is very, very rare. Um, Gene is desperate for you and I to swap data with your, your method because... Um, so just this report was done with Gene Kim and Jess Humble that's right. as well, with Puppet Labs. So what we haven't shared and we we're very reluctant to share is the actual global consumption stats for open source hygiene. And one of the ones we looked at at a glance, um, and I'm going to use the correlation word you use because that's all it is, is correlation. Gene said, I wonder if surface area, which is how many versions of a project are you using in active deployment, um, correlates with the stock price of publicly traded companies. And at a, at a glance, it does. <laughs> so if we can start to make arguments that could show up in the Wall Street Journal um, about here are the tangible correlations between market performance and supply chain hygiene, it'll be very easy to get executive air cover to do so. Yeah, so one thing I didn't mention, so when we did the report in 2014 and I threw in organizational performance in the survey, Gene and Jez were like, yeah, that's a great idea. And I was like, oh, like, this has never shown up. This hasn't shown up for 40 years. This is a, a massive, like, I really hope this pans out. Um, and the only reason I thought it might pan out is because so much of DevOps looks very, very similar to lean, lean principles, lean menu, but in the manufacturing mm. process. I mean, agile, y'all are sweet, but like, it's never panned. <laughs> like it's never, it's never panned out. It's never shown up. It's shown up in two or three studies, but it's only shown up in ROI and only after a three to five year lag. And then it only hangs out for one to two years and then it disappears. So the fact that this is showing up in the bottom line consistently, including like when I throw in all the control variables is a really, really, really big deal. And when I mentioned it to my friends in academia, it's so like I have a PhD, I do all this stuff, I do research, I do peer review. They told me I was completely full of shit. And I showed them my data under NDA and they ran it and they lost their minds. So like everyone is super, super excited now. So this is, this is a big deal. This is really, really exciting. All big stats words aside, thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> right, well, I went through the questions. So this is teaching you people, if you want to ask a question, stick them in the, the uh, app, because that's where I was reading some of these questions from. Uh, we're running a little bit late for lunch, so unless somebody has an absolute burning question, but we're going to be... So remember this conference, so I, I did a little overview, and then we went over some the areas this morning. Now we get to drill in for an, uh, the next day and a half, just getting into more and more detail. So there'll be plenty of opportunities to ask more questions. 
Um, so lunch is downstairs. I believe this lunch is actually sponsored by Battery Ventures, who I work for. So yeah, 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 lunch. Yeah, yeah. We get, I think that's what we ended up sponsoring. Venture lunch. <laughs> be uh, back at 1.30 to um, get through more ruggedness. Thanks everyone.